nothing will be impossible for you. Matthew 17, 20. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather this morning to worship you. And those who are present as well as those watching this morning, Lord, we pray that we will sense that camaraderie we have as we join hands and hearts together in worship. We'll lift our voices in praise in a moment to thank you as well through song. And I trust, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts today, that we might be mindful of that which you want us to do, and then we'll give you the praise and the glory by being obedient. We know that it's important that we do that which, <clears throat> which you share for us to do. So make it clear to us. And as we worship you, Lord, know also of the concerns we have on our hearts for others. You know the joys and the thanksgivings. You know also the, the sorrows through death and sickness and other kinds of needs. Lord, we just pray that as you hear our prayer, you will answer in a way that will bring great glory to your name. So accept our praise and thanksgiving and speak to our hearts is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, this is number one. Number one. Uh -huh. There we go. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory! Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love. cleansing blood I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption some sweet day sing up there the song of victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him me to victory beneath the cleansing that chorus. 
chorus one more time. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me. Good morning. I feel like I'm under the cleansing flood, but it's sweat. Okay? I got hot. So if y'all see water, I would like to say it's Jesus cleansing flood, but right now it's just sweat. But it is good to see y'all this morning. You know what starts next Monday, a week from tomorrow? VBS. VBS. And we're going to say yeah, 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 yes to Vavava VBS. We're going to have a great time just reminding you of that and and looking forward to seeing you here then. But have you ever made a mistake? Did you ever make a mistake? I heard the word every day come somewhere out of the air. It just floated down to me. That's right. We make, I can't count the ones I've made this morning. I made one back there and made the PowerPoint disappear completely into another file. And I have no idea where it went. It's out there somewhere floating inside our computer doing a circle or something. I don't know what it's doing. I also made another one, and I'm glad I found it because I notice my mistakes on the PowerPoint. I try to go over it. I try to go back over it. I look at it again on Sunday morning, go through it again, and I still have mistakes on there. When I looked at it this morning, oh, I had a big one that would have been so funny. I think everybody would have laughed. It was supposed to say, God's kingdom grows steadily. I had God's kingdom crows steadily. So, yeah, now I know y'all are going to think that now when you look at it, but just know it could have been worse. I could have had it up there, but we all make mistakes from time to time. And you know, that's why they make these things right here with this little thing on the end of it. What is that on the end? An eraser. What does it do? It erases your mistakes. Okay, you can write with a pencil. Now, you've got to be really sure of what you're doing when you write with a fountain pen because you can't erase it. But when you write with a pencil, you can erase your mistakes, and we all know that we're not perfect. And uh, some mistakes are big mistakes and can affect a lot of people, and some mistakes are small mistakes, and nobody ever may notice. Now, if I hadn't told you all about crow instead of grow you wouldn't have known it this morning because I got it fixed but if I hadn't fixed it you definitely would have known and you'd have hear I'd have heard people laughing behind me and you know little giggles and they're trying not to laugh but God knows we make mistakes now the mistakes we made like that there there's no I didn't sin when I made that mistake and put the wrong letter on it I just mistyped the wrong letter and all that but we also make mistakes and do things wrong that are considered sins in God's eyes, things that we do wrong, things that we do that we shouldn't do and things that we don't do that we should be doing. But, you know, God knows that. There's a verse in the Bible, Romans 3.23, says that for everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the glory of God is, is where he wants us to be, to be perfect like he is. And we can't do that. And he knows that we have a nature in us to sin, and God knows that. And we all fall short of hitting that mark and, and being where God wants us to be. But, you know, just like this pencil, when we make a mistake on paper, we can erase it. God has a way to offer us not just erasing our sins, but he forgives our sins. When we confess our sins to him, in fact, that's in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful enough to hear our sins and to cleanse us from our sins. And so we can be thankful for that, that God can be like the eraser in our life when it comes to sin. Now, here still on earth, when we do something wrong, we have to suffer the consequences. Like if you, if you get talking in class, God will forgive you for it, but the teacher will 
punish you. I don't know what your school does, draw a stick or make you stand in the hall or something. So we still have to suffer the consequences on earth, but we know in our relationship with God that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all the unrighteousness, from all the bad things that we have in our life. But no, we try, we try to live our lives like Jesus did, and we know Jesus was sinless, he was perfect, but we just don't quite hit it. But we can be thankful that God does forgive it, give us our sins. In fact, so much that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten his son, his only one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for our love to us. And God, you know that sometimes we mess up and blow it and we say or do things that are wrong. But God, we are so grateful that you do offer forgiveness. Lord, that you're there for us. And God, we pray that as you forgive us, that we would be able to forgive other people because we know that's what you want us to do. And Lord, even I guess harboring unforgiveness is a sin in our life. And and help us with that. God, I thank you for these boys and girls that are here today and those watching by live stream. And Lord, help them to realize that even though they make a mistake in life, it's, they don't just need to throw in the towel, Lord, but ask for forgiveness and know that you'll hear and answer their prayer. Be with us as we worship today. Lord, you have a message and a word for each of us to hear and help us to open our ears and our hearts. And then at the end of the service and when the time is right to make the decision you would have us make. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Sweetly, Lord, we, we heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints fall. Jesus, that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountains, Siloam's fountains helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where Then at last, when on high he sees us, our journey done, we will rest where the steps of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. we come to this offertory time we're certainly thankful for what God's blessed us with and the opportunity to give back a portion to him and I pray that God will truly take this and bless it in a special way and Frank would you lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving dear gracious heavenly father we want to thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and praise your name Lord and Lord we want you to just bless this offering that uh, as we give back a portion, small portion of what you've given to us, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
And as my brother sent me a, a little cartoon this week, actually it's a, a true, truism. It says, uh, don't worry about dying because you're going to live forever. The only thing you need to worry about is location, location, location. There's coming a great day for those that are ready for his return. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4 this morning. Mark chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 32. The mystery of the mustard seed. How many of you were raised on a farm? Any of you? I know some of you were. few of you. Okay. How many of you, I know we're in a farming area, but your parents or grandparents were, were farmers? Any of you? Okay. A few more of your hands went up with that one. We, we know a lot about farming in this area because there's a lot of it that goes on around us, all kinds of crops and, and uh, large fields. Used to, uh, they were much smaller. Now one guy with uh, one of the size tractors they use today can farm a thousand acres by himself. In fact, I talked to a man a couple of years ago who was, he and his two sons farmed 3,000 acres and, you know, that was unheard of back in the day when I was growing up. And most of your parents or grandparents who were farmers, it was not that way either. But Jesus used parables dealing with agriculture, farming, that kind of thing. Because 2,000 years ago, every listener was familiar with planting seeds and harvesting crops. That was just in their, their, their knowledge. They, they did it. They couldn't just run down to the store and pick up food like you do today. They knew that milk came from a cow, not from a grocery store out of a carton, you know. Uh, it, it, it was that way. So many of his parables were about plants and seeds and that kind of thing. And he's going to teach us about planting wheat seeds as well as mustard seeds in this parable. Follow with me as I read verses 26 to 32, where he says, The kingdom of God is like this, he said. A man scattered seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the ripe grain on the head. But as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, how can we illustrate the kingdom of God or what parable can we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed that, when sown in the soil, is smaller than all the seeds on the ground. And when, it, when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the vegetables and produces large branches, so that the birds of the air can nest in its shade. Now, the only kind of mustard that many of you are familiar with is that that you put on a hot dog. A few others of you know about mustard seeds that uh, produce a a green leafy vegetable in the fall primarily. We call it mustard, greens, and, uh, and, and that can be cooked down. But this mustard seed produced a different kind of plant than that that we are familiar with. But in the area where Jesus was, there were many mustard plants. They were, they were plentiful, and they would be familiar with this particular uh, parable. And the seed is a mystery. When you stop and think about it, Jesus said that a farmer plants a seed, but he doesn't know how it grows. A man with a Ph.D., though, in agriculture and agriculture science uh, was talking about this verse one day, and here's how he put it. He said, uh, Jesus said, we don't know how a seed grows. That's no longer true. We know exactly how it grows. Heat and moisture cause the seed to germinate. It sends roots downward for moisture and shoots upward for the sun. We know how a seed grows, but we don't know why a seed grows, end of quote. Only God knows that, doesn't he? Seeds are mysterious and mighty. Seeds have been found in the tombs of pharaohs that they have taken and planted and actually would see them come up and produce a plant. And yet, if you buy some in the store, if they're a couple of years old, you'll be lucky if you get very many of the seeds to germinate. I don't know what would cause one in, the, in a pyramid to germinate and, and grow, and those in the store sometimes don't after they get a couple of years old. But you know, Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that's planted. 
And I want us to look at three ways that the mustard seed grows that's like the kingdom of heaven. How does he draw this comparison with something they were very familiar with, with something that he was trying to help them understand and help us understand? First of all, God's kingdom starts out small. It starts small. He said, it's like a mustard seed that when sown in the soil is smaller than all the seeds on the ground. Now, we know that the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed in the world, but it is very small. In fact, probably the smallest in that area of the world. We're told, and I haven't tried it to see, but we're told that you can put 200 mustard seeds on the face of a penny and that it takes almost a thousand mustard seeds to weigh even an ounce. That's a lot. It's a small seed, in other words. This particular seed that they had that grew into a large plant. Once there was a group of tourists that were visiting in Europe, and one of the tourists asked the guide, were there any famous men born in this city? To which the guide said, nope, only babies. You got it. Okay. The kingdom of God started out with a baby, didn't it? With a baby born in Bethlehem named Jesus. And even when Jesus died, the kingdom was still small. God specializes in taking small, insignificant things and using them in great ways. After the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, the Jews returned from the exile and started to build another temple. It was not it, even when they finished it, it was not like the first one. But still there was the anxiousness of being able to build one. And, and, and Zerubbabel was the governor, and he believed that it could happen even amidst the rubble that was there in that city that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. The prophet Zechariah wrote these words on the day that Zerubbabel laid the first stone. And I quote from chapter 4, verse 10, for who scorns the day of small things? He's talking about all small things. He's, he's going to talk about that temple next, but who scorns the day of small things? These seven eyes of the Lord, which scan throughout the whole earth, will rejoice when they see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. As I said, the temple was ultimately built, although it wasn't nearly as beautiful and ornate as Solomon's temple had been. But it started out by the laying of one stone. Never despise the day of small beginnings. Years ago, and I've shared this, te this illustration before because it show so shows how God works in the lives of people. But it was a snowy evening in England, and a young teenager was trying to find his way to church. And in that driving snow, he turned the wrong way and wound up in a a small Methodist church that even the preacher wasn't able to make it there that day because of the, uh, the snowstorm. And one of the laymen got up in that service to bring a message, and his, it came from one verse out of Isaiah, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And the preaching of that message or the sharing of that verse of Scripture and making of comments about it spurred the heart of that young teenager. A mustard seed was planted in his heart. His name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who would later go on to preach the gospel to thousands in England, built a tabernacle that would seat 5,000, and they said it was never able to hold all of those who wanted to come. Truly, God specializes in small things, and it starts with small things. But secondly, God's kingdom grows steadily. It grows steadily. It says in verse 32, And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the vegetables and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. He's trying to help them see this is how large that plant gets, even to the point that birds can come and, and build a nest there. Well, it takes some supporting limbs to build a nest or as it is the case around here, they love to build on top of those gutters. I guess it's in, out of uh, the rain, it's protected, it's out of the reach of uh, cats as well, and they build their, they love to build on top of these. But he's saying that even 
this mustard seed produces a plant that's large enough for the birds to come and nest in. That's a huge plant from such a tiny seed. And yet from the beginnings of, of, of God's work there in Bethlehem, God had been at work all before, but the beginning of his church, as he, as he sent his son to be our Savior, that tiny beginning in Bethlehem, it's grown remarkably. The church of the Lord started only with a few people and has grown to be a global family. In fact, after at the end of about three and a half years of ministry, when he ascends back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes upon those that are left praying in that upper room, the Bible tells us that there were only 120 there in that room. There were 11 apostles and 109 others joining them in that upper room. It says in Acts 1.15, During these days Peter stood up among the brothers. The number of people who were together was about 120. Now those 120 prayed for 10 days, and God's presence came and filled them, and they went out to share the good news with those of the city about this Jesus that they had crucified. He's the Christ that's been promised. He was the one that for ages had been told he would come and give his life as a ransom for our sins. Peter preached that message, and the Bible says that on that day 3,000 trusted the Lord. Many of those who had known about the killing, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, but also knew about the resurrection that had followed three days later, now committed their lives to following Jesus as well. And the Scripture says in Acts 2.41, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And then verse 47, And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Almost overnight it grew from 120 to 3,000. A few verses later you're going to see that already by then another 5,000 have committed their life to the Lord. And daily such as should be saved. And a few verses later it says, And the Lord multiplied. It went from addition to multiplication of the number of people who were trusting. Today there are over 2 billion people who claim to be Christians scattered throughout the earth. Consider those small beginnings grow steadily. Consider what God is doing in China. In 1949, it was estimated that there were less than 400,000 Christians in China. Today, a conservative estimate is that there are 163 million Christians in China, more Christians in China than there are in the United States. And yet it represents a small percentage of their population. It represents 12% of 1.4 billion people who live in China. Even in a country where the, uh, the gospel is suppressed, where you can lose your life for talking about Jesus or committing your life to the Lord Jesus, there are those who are continuing to trust Him and the numbers are growing. God's kingdom will continue to grow until one day heaven will not even be able to count them. John described his, this vision that he had of the throne room in Revelation 7, 9. It says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. God knows who all is there. He knows the numbers. If he knows the numbers of the hairs on your head this morning, he knows how many people will be in heaven on that day as well. But John is describing a vision of those in heaven from all races, all tribes, every uh, place in the earth. And for him, from, from his vantage point, he said, you can't even number them. There are so many that he saw. Yes, the growth of God's kingdom isn't just true in terms of numerical growth. It's also true as he grows in your heart and mine as well. You see, he's not just interested in numbers of people coming to know him, which is vitally important. He wants to grow in your life and mine. He wants to produce himself, reproduce himself in us, that we be like him. Now, we can't be Jesus, but our life is supposed to bring glory to him, and we're supposed to become a, be like him and be growing in our relationship with him every day. That's why a person who is many years as a Christian should no longer be a baby in Christ. 
Paul was speaking about the church in Corinth there, and he said, look, I'd love to give you meat to eat, but you're still babes in Christ, and I'm needing to feed you milk. He wants us to grow. You know what happens if a baby doesn't grow? There's something wrong, isn't it? I mean, it's, there's a, a, a problem. If a child doesn't grow, we so often say, oh, I wish I could keep them little. And, and you'd love to hug, hug them and cuddle them, but I, you wouldn't want them to stay small all their life. I know what that can be like. I remember when I was a student at Louisiana College, we went to, uh, there's two hills in, in Pineville. One for those who have had mental problems after they were born, and, and then those who are born with uh, mental uh, problems. Pinecrest, there it is, it came to me. Pinecrest State Hospital. And there was an a area there that our psychology class was going and we were learning and studying. And we went to this area where there, it looked like a nursery. And there were several babies there. And they began to tell us the age of those. And they were several, one of them was eight or nine years old. And they said it's unusual that they would live to be this old and yet still a baby. You know, it'd break your heart. That's, you, you, yes, you, you want to keep them little, but you want them to grow too. When we say we want to keep them little, it's because we love them in their innocence and their, the, the, the being able to cuddle with them, but keep cuddling even as they get grown. They're never too big to cuddle, are they? Keep cuddling your kids. It, it's that God wants to grow in our hearts and lives too. He wants us to, we began as a newborn babe in Christ, the Bible says, and he wants us to grow in our relationship with him. The future of God's kingdom is that he's going to rule over the whole earth, the Bible says. And he, when he returns, that's going to be possible. But for now, the kingdom of God is within us, the scripture says. And just as seed grows, we grow toward spiritual Christian maturity as well. What is the kingdom of God? In Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul was addressing a group of people who were still hung up on the rules and regulations that the Jews had grown up under, those dietary laws and everything. That's the reason he's saying God's kingdom isn't about eating and drinking. It's not necessarily about the things you do with your life. What his kingdom is all about is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's that we are to grow in the Lord. There's to be that inner peace that we enjoy with Christ. It, it's about the overflowing joy that we have in Jesus. It's about our experience of, of his presence in our life to help us no matter what it is that we might encounter in life. Jesus said, I'll be with you. And the kingdom of God has come within our lives, but it's still a part of all God's people together producing this that's supposed to spread out to the world about us. You see, if we're experiencing the presence of God in our life, and there's that joy and peace that only He can bring into our life, then as we're among others who are distraught because of the problems of life, who are not experiencing peace in life, it's that our life can be a testimony to them of what God can do in the midst of difficulties. We experience it like everybody else. We have those troubles and trials, but the manner in which we encounter those should be different from that in which the world encounters it because we have God's presence with us, within us, to enable us to be able to handle these things better. That's His promise to us. I've come into your life to help strengthen you, to, to forgive your sins, yes, but also in a daily experience of, of walking with me to know what it's like to experience a peace in the midst of chaos, to experience joy when others can't find that joy. And it's that which comes from the Lord and his presence with us. But there's one other way in which the mustard seed illustrates God's kingdom, and that that's the fact that God's kingdom offers shelter as well. He described that with a mustard seed. It said, and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. 
There's a spiritual application here as well. Just as the mustard seed provides shelter for the birds, we find protection in God's kingdom. The Bible says the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Let me share with you at least three ways that we can find that shelter and protection in the branches of God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, you find rest from the weariness of life. You find rest from the weariness of life. Remember that old song, I'm tired and weary, but I must travel on? <laughs> there will be peace in the valley. That's the name of the song. Some of you probably don't even remember that one. But there is peace in the valley, in the valleys of life, when God is with you. Jesus even said it as it's recorded in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. Just as the birds find rest and shelter in the branches of the mustard plant, we can find rest for our souls in Jesus Christ. The yoke of Jesus isn't a heavy yoke because he's the one who's carrying the biggest burden of it. He carries that and brings us along with him. Yoke would put two oxen together who would usually be pulling together. That was the best way for them to be able to plow. And he says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It didn't mean that there's not a, a, a work <coughs> to be done for the Lord. It's meaning that God's going to be the one who's carrying the load. We're working alongside him. He's the one preparing the way. He's the one making the way straight. He's the one providing the opportunities for us. And it is that he will provide strength for us too. His burden is light because he's the one on the other side providing that strength. Can you imagine the life of a little bird? They fly around, but they can't stay in the air forever. They've got to find a place to, to land and rest. Does that describe your life? Are you trying to go and go and go and not ever stop and rest? You can yoke up with Jesus today. You can find a place of to land and rest in him because you don't have to worry. Jesus knows what's happening in your life. He knows what's going to happen in your life, and you can truly rest in him knowing that he's going to guide you through whatever the experience is that you and I will encounter each and every day. It doesn't catch him by surprise. He's aware of it before we ever get to it, and he knows how he's going to guide us through it. And he knows how he can use that experience as an opportunity to bring glory to himself. You're his, if you're a child of his. If you're a Christian, if you've placed your faith and trust in him, then you belong to him. And he says, I will be with you. I'm going to guide you. I I'm going to take care of you. And he will. God used, God, uh, Jesus used God's care of the birds to illustrate the fact that we shouldn't worry. He said, consider the birds of the air. They don't work or worry, but their heavenly Father takes care of them. One of my favorite little poems is an imaginary uh, conversation between two birds. Said the robin to the sparrow, I'd really like to know why these anxious human creatures rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. The birds of the air know that God takes care of them. And we have a heavenly father who said, how much more do you mean to me than even those birds? He said, I know when even a sparrow falls to the ground. And if I know that and I'm taking care of the birds of the air, know that I love you even more. And then another thing, God's kingdom not only provides rest from the weariness of life, but you can find shelter from God's wrath against sin as well. You see, the prophet Zephaniah proclaimed, Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. <clears throat> what he's saying is, if you seek the Lord, then when his anger comes because of your sin, perhaps you will be sheltered. Well, the New Testament tells us that that perhaps 
you will find shelter is a certainty for us. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, that uncertainty that perhaps becomes a certainty for us in Christ because we have that promise of God that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins have been forgiven when you are in Christ Jesus. Zephaniah was trying to say, look, perhaps God will have favor on you in the time of judgment if you do what you're supposed to do. In the New Testament, we're told, look, God has told us for certain that if you place your faith and trust in Him, you can know that there's no condemnation. God's going to take care of you. Interesting, in the days of the Wild West, when there would be prairie fires that would get started, the wind would drive that uh, the fire through the grass, and it would be faster, it would travel faster than you could travel even on a horse. And one of the things that the, the cowboy would do, and I'm not talking about a Dallas cowboy here, I'm talking about the Wild West cowboys. One of the things they would do would get off their horde. They'd, they'd, when they saw a fire coming like that, they would start a fire near them that would spread back toward the other fire, and then they would get into that burnt out area, and they were safe because the fire would come as far as that that had been burned back, the back fire as you call it, and it would stop. It would go around them and travel on in other areas. Well, the Bible tells us that that's exactly what happens in, in your relationship and mine uh, with, with, with our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one place where God's wrath against sin has already judged, and that was at the cross. You see, God's wrath was poured out upon His Son as Jesus paid the price for our sins. So if you're at the cross, you're like that cowboy who's in the burned out spot. The wrath of God can't get to you because it's already come upon his son who took upon himself your sins and mine and paid the price for them. We're safe at the foot of the cross in our trusting of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Stand at the cross and accept the shelter that God provides. It's available for all who will trust the Lord. And then last, in God's kingdom, you can also find protection and peace, eternal protection and peace. John continued to describe the multitude in heaven this way in the book of Revelation. He said, for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. The one seated on the throne will shelter them, for the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In Jesus, we find help for today, but also hope for tomorrow. Heaven is real. Even before there was a book and a movie by that same title, Heaven is Real. Our Lord told us about it. He came from heaven to earth and lived among us and then ascended back to the Father in heaven. And we truly can understand that there are some things that we have to put up with on here, here on earth that won't be there on the other side. But he promised even in the putting up of those things here on earth, he'll be with us to help us in doing that. But on the other side, there's not even going to be a tear. No more tears in heaven. I love C.S. Lewis' famous quote on heaven. He said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. You and I were made for another world. There is shelter in the kingdom of God. A Sunday school teacher was teaching her class and trying to help them understand about heaven and, and that it was important to trust Jesus as your Savior so you could go to heaven. So she asked the question, do, do, you, do any of you know how you go to heaven? One little boy shot his hand up. He said, yes, you die. <laughs> well, yes, you have to die first, don't you? He had that right. But then you better be sure that you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Because when you die, the thing that matters most is location, location, location. I have to take that from the realtors, Right. That's what's most important is location. And when you're faced with eternity, you're going to live forever. What matters most is the location. 
our Lord Jesus wants us to be with him forever. He wants, us to, he wants to guide us through this life and help us and then bring us on into his presence when this life is over. And the reason for leaving us here in this life once we've trusted him is to help others get to know him. That your life will be an example for them of what it's like to commit a life to Jesus and have his strength and help for daily living. What's the takeaway of the parable of the mystery of the mighty mustard seed? God delights to bring great things out of humble beginnings. He always starts small, but he brings great things out of humble beginnings. Think about it in the Bible. You had men like Moses. He took a stuttering, washed-out, 80-year-old man, that mustard seed, and used him to deliver God's people out of Egypt. He took Gideon, a man who was asked to go. He said, look, Lord, I'm not qualified for this. But he said, look, I want you to go and be the leader of my army. Gideon gathered 32,000 people to go against a, an army that was over 100,000 people. And when God was talking to Gideon, he said, that's too many. And Gideon's thinking, that's not enough. And, of course, they pared it down to 300 and God was able to take that mustard seed and bring about a mighty victory for his people in which they didn't even use a sword on that day. One day, a little mustard seed of a boy gave God his lunch of five loaves. It'd be, it wasn't a loaf of bread like we think of, more like a biscuit, and two fish. I'm not sure what size the fish must have been, but God took it that day and he blessed it, and he fed over 5,000 people. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. We don't know how many there were. But that one little lunch, that mustard seed, he took and multiplied it to feed a multitude of people. Sometimes little words spoken at the right time to the right person can have a huge impact on a life. One of my spiritual heroes is John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. I remember my grandmother who was Methodist saying, I wish we could get back to our founders when, uh, in her day. But Wesley rode a horse thousands of miles around England preaching in fields and town squares because the Anglican church had defrocked him. And one day as he was riding on his horse, he was accosted by a thief who wanted all of his money, and he got off his horse and he emptied his pockets, and he only had a few coins with him. It perplexed the robber as he thought it, there would be more. And he said, well, you look at my saddlebags. Anything you want, you can have. And the thief got what he wanted and, and was about to leave. And Wesley said, wait just a minute. I've got something I want to say to you. And Wesley said this. The man turned back and he said, you may someday live to regret this life. And if you do, remember these few words. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And the robber left. A few years later, at the closing of one of the services where Wesley was preaching, a man came up to him, and Wesley recognized it as being that thief. But now he was well-dressed. He was a merchant. But most importantly, he found out he had, uh, had accepted Christ as his Savior, had committed his life to the Lord. And the man knelt down in front of Wesley. Wesley wanted to make him stand up. He said, no, I want you to know that you, let me, let me read, to you, sir, I owe it all. Your words changed my life. And he returned the money to Wesley that he had taken from him and told him about the change in his life that had come about. Those words, you may someday live to regret this life. And if you do, remember these few words, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, those same words are true for you and me today. Doesn't matter what life brings, whether you're tired of life or fed up with life or whatever it might be, truly the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us of all sin if you'll accept it. He makes an invitation to you and me to come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. 
I'll forgive your sins. I'll take over the reins that I'll guide you in life, and I'll be here to help you with that life. That's his promise. Let God plant that seed in your heart and see what happens. Would you bow with us in prayer? If, you're never, if you've never trusted the Lord, I invite you this morning to consider what Jesus can do if you'll let him. He'll come in, take up residency, but he'll help you <clears throat> to fulfill the very purpose for which he created you. If you are a Christian, are you living in light of the promises of God? Are you finding that rest in him? Are you finding that shelter from the storms of life? in him that protection and peace that he offers it's available it comes by just trusting him and realizing you can't handle it yourself and let him guide you fathers you speak to our hearts right now i pray that you will have your way in each of our lives you taught us about the mustard seed to teach us about your kingdom and I pray that we too will understand that you have a kingdom waiting. And that kingdom is even partly here on earth because you're here. You're here with us. But one day we're going to be transformed to a place where there's no more sickness, sorrow, tears, no troubles. All of the former things are going to be passed away. But only those who've committed to you and have trusted you will know that joy. I pray if there's someone here who's never trusted you that this morning might be that moment in which they give to you that mustard seed of a life. I know each of us thinks I'm not very much, but I give it to you, Lord. And we allow you to do what you want in and through us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing our hymn of invitation, if the Holy Spirit's leading you this morning, to make a commitment of life, we invite you to come. Whatever that decision might be, trusting Him as Savior and Lord of life, rededicating your life, moving your membership to go to work with God's people here, whatever, you let the Lord have His way as we sing together. I have heard the voice of Jesus calling clearly far Speaking to your heart, you can come even now, whatever it might be, let him have his way. That's where you find rest. Say, Lord, I've been trying my best. I want to give it all over to you. He died to save me. Now I long to make it. Thank you for your presence this morning, and I pray that you will 
just as you leave here, let God just continue to be with you in a special way. And if there's a decision you didn't make that you need to, if there are questions, let us know. We want to help you in answering those questions that can help you be where God wants you to be with your life. Hope you'll be back tonight at 5.30 for our evening worship time together, 4.30 for choir practice. So uh, keep that in mind and hope you have a blessed day and we'll see you later. Let's remember to pray for one another as we go from this place. And uh, may God bless you in a special way. Let's bow together. And Pharaoh Sims, would you lead us in our benediction? Heavenly Father, be with us now as we leave this place and go our separate ways. Help us to take to heart today's message and know that if we have that faith the size of a mustard seed, through you nothing's impossible to us. Amen.